Dibyesh, Professor Dibyesh Anand. Most of you would be our students, but they would be people from outside the university also. So welcome to you all. Um, in fact, the origin uh, talk series, and this is the first talk as part of that series, uh, comes from our module Post-Colonial Politics and International Relations. And it comes from demands of our students, where they wanted to know more about what's happening to Uyghur Muslims in particular in China, right, and, and the Chinese occupation. But it was a part of the broader theme on coloniality and dehumanization. That's the discussion we are having. So colonial dehumanization. So this is, and I'm part of Center for the Study of Democracy at University of Westminster. For over years, we have worked a lot on all kinds of oppressions and occupations, but that includes, in my case, own case, it was largely about Tibet and Tibetans. But in recent years, I started paying attention to Uyghurs also. And I remember the conference, it was 2014, where Aziz, I also met Aziz and David, who's another president, I met him there. And Dolkun Isai, another speaker today, of course, I met him separately. And in fact, Dolkun, you may not remember, but my last public event was at this uh, Tibetan uh, uprising day on 10th of March, where we met. And you know, we both were keynote speakers there. But the reason I highlight this is because as part of the Center for Study of Democracy, we are committed to speaking truth to power. We are, committing, we are committed to supporting knowledge that challenges occupation, occupation coloniality, and dehumanization. We do not believe in being neutral when you're faced with, let's say, a strong occupying power, strong oppressive power, and the op occupied or oppressed. I say occupied, oppressed, because context might differ. So we have uh, colleagues working in Palestine, we have colleagues working in Kashmir, and a lot of us work in some of people are interested in Kurdistan, Uyghurs, Tibetans. So oppression, occupation, uses that take place in different parts of the world. So that's the origin of. Uh, uh, what we are doing and maybe uh, towards the end of this session if you have any more ideas of what more can we do which other areas you want to you want us to focus on we are more than happy to organize similar kind of events so i'll start with thanking first anna purnamanan anna uh, who has organized this event she's one of the lecturers who is teaching on the model thank you anna uh, and we have three speakers today and of course we start with an apology i've made so many starts but okay i start with an apology that apology is for having a manner all male uh, panel and that is not because we were not aware of it. In fact, we did start with approaching colleagues who are women, but for various reasons, they could not make it to this session. So we start with apologies. So the reason for Manal, therefore, is not because we are not conscious of the need to challenge male dominance in every sphere, but it's because we could not get speakers at the start notice. So I thought we'll start with that. So we have three speakers. Each one of them will speak for maximum 10 minutes. But I'll ask them to I'll give them an extra minute. And the reason for extra minute is simple, because rather than me introducing them, which is very formal, I'd like to introduce, I'd like them to introduce themselves, right? But uh, we'll first have Dolkun Isa. So we'll start with Dolkun. Dolkun, the floor is yours. Okay. S thank you very much. Uh, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank. Thank you for your inviting me to uh, speak today. Uh, I think most of some uh, participants and students, I'm very excited uh, when I speak in the, at the university or speaking uh, to the students because I was a student 30 years ago. Uh, when I was a student's time, I start my uh, activism uh, right off the Uyghurs and that's why I was uh, expelled, kick also from the university. I was not able to graduate uh, university in the 1980s. So that's why when I saw the students, when I speak at the university, I immediately remember my students' time. So the, the situation of Uyghurs now it is really awful. Uh, as I say, I have been an activist for the Uyghur right and the freedom of the 30 years. I start my human rights activism in the 1980s, leading student democracy protests in East Turkestan. I have been advocating for the basic uh, human rights and freedom of the Uyghur people to be respected for almost uh, my entire life. But the situation in Turkestan now is worse. It has been in my lifetime. Currently, at least 3 million innocent Uyghur, Kazakh, and the other people are being arbitrary detention in the 21st century concentration camp. All families are suffering, being tortured and dying in the camps. Uh, there are innocent people, uh, mothers, brothers, fathers, sisters, sons, daughters, 
who have been deprived of their liberty, subject to horrific abuse, including political indoctrination, torture, and uh, slowly, uh, slowly because of their we were because of uh, ethnicity. In the past five years, in particular, we have witnessed strategy of the Chinese uh, uh, Communist Party shift to social reengineering of Uyghur people. Everything that uh, makes the Uyghur people unique or language, religious, uh, country uh, has been targeted. The young generation of Uyghur are being targeted in particularly for the indoctrination. So-called bilingual education program have four years have been undermining the Uyghur language in school and the force Uyghur students to use uh, Chinese language. We have also witnessed mass collection of personal data of, uh, uh, date from uh, CCTV scanners, facial recognition software, public database, police checkpoint, and from the DNA and the blood sample, which is analyzed using artificial intelligence in the large data hopes. Around three or four years ago, we began to receive news that we were being rounded up and put in the concentration camp. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party CCP quickly moved cut off all communication between uh, the Uyghur in Strixstan and diaspora. All Uyghur who have lived in uh, exile in Europe, United States, Turkey, and Germany, uh, UK, uh, have lost contact with the family member. I'm the one of them. Uh, but very, very short uh, telephone communication with my, my mother, uh, April 2017. Almost three and a half years, I have completely lost contact with my family uh, member. But uh, during that time, I got very heartbreaking news. My mother uh, died uh, 2018 uh, in May. But I got this news nearly three weeks later, uh, middle of June 2018. Uh, this is the only news which I got uh, since the three and a half years. And this year, uh, uh, in the beginning of the January, I got second heartbreaking news from the Chinese media, uh, Chinese Global Times, reported uh, and one report and learned my father passed away. Uh, but I don't know uh, when, which condition, where is my father passed away and where is his cemetery is. Uh, but uh, I learned uh, from the international media, my mother was died in the concentration camp, one of the concentration camp. She was 78 years old lady, uh, prisoners, but uh, she was uh, dating nearly one year uh, in one of the concentration camp and she died in the 18. And uh, uh, another heartbreaking news on my, my personal story, my older brother, he is the uh, mathematics professor, one of the college in my hometown in Aksu. Uh, last year when I was in Tokyo, I learned uh, this news, uh, he was sentenced 17 years, uh, so-called separatism. And my younger brother, Hushtar Isa, uh, he disappeared since 2016. This is the, all my ho family, a horrible situation, but I have no idea how many family members outside, how many in the concentration camp, how many died, uh, still unknown for me. Uh, this is the, my personal story, but most of them Uyghur who live in exile have the same personal story, even some story is horrible than my story. Yeah. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Uyghur are being subject to modern slavery today and the first labor making projects for Western company. Uh, you know, ASP Australian Strategy Policy Institute uh, published a report in March and the saying, and the report saying, 82,000 Uyghur uh, and uh, subject for the forced labor for the Western company. Today, so many Western company, German company, UK company, US, uh, European company, and uh, continue make business. Uh, and uh, cotton industry, 85% cotton industry holds China from Eastern for the forced labor. Uh, this is the 22 percentage is global uh, cotton industries. This is all coming uh, from the forced labor. Uh, and Uyghur people have been, all, have been forced to uh, endure uh, one atrocity to another atrocity. They have struggled to find work to uh, strong enough, accurate, describe the horrors Uyghur has been subjected to. Within the last three years, we have described the situation, one of the largest mass arbitrary detention of the innocent people in modern, modern human history total assimilation, social reengineering, crime against humanity, and the genocide now. 
After testimony as a camp uh, survivor, uh, New York Times report, Karakash list, report Aspi, and report uh, by the Adria Zans, no other word can describe what is happening to the Uyghur people besides genocide. CCP has been trying to uh, diminish or wipe out the next generation of Uyghurs through the mass sterilization and the population control measure focused on the Uyghur women. In the last three years, CCP has not only uh, tried to destroy our, our identity, they have been trying to destroy other, uh, the people. Now, uh, but this is not new. Of course, most of some international media and international uh, uh, organizations, some country know and ready and uh, take uh, attention uh, and speak out slowly. Uh, as you know, yesterday, uh, uh, 39 uh, country uh, and plus Turkey and 40 country uh, speak out and uh, join uh, issues of uh, joint statement ask the Chinese government and close down the concentration camp and uh, uh, ask, uh, ask the Chinese government uh, allowed to international investigation group, particularly UN uh, uh, Human Rights uh, uh, High Commissioner and expert uh, should be uh, investigated this uh, uh, atrocity. Uh, but this is the most new because most of them people thinking just this atrocity, this genocide, this assimilation policy towards the Uyghur just beginning recently since two, three, five years. No, it's completely wrong. This uh, Uyghur have been suffering systematically from my right abuse hand of the Chinese Communist Party since occupation. East Turkestan has been occupied, military occupied by 1949 by Chinese uh, Communist Army. Uh, as after occupation, 1955, the Chinese government redesigned East Turkestan and the autonomous region, remaining uh, the redesigned Xinjiang Uyghur autonomous region, and the promise it will be respect the cultural, economic, political, religious right of the Uyghur people of Turkestan. And this term, Chinese government also promised uh, to respect the Uyghur uh, right of self-determination as well. However, Chinese government never keep its promise. There is no single autonomy in East Turkestan. And uh, all present fundamental human rights and the freedom we will include in civil, political, economic, social, cultural rights continue to be oily, uh, violated. This autonomy is just a paper autonomy. This autonomy just uh, brings the suffering, brings the killing. This autonomy uh, now brings more than 3 million people uh, located on concentration camp. All decision maker power in the region uh, list in the hand, hand Chinese. Uh, Communist Party and uh, and uh, 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 largely with the Chinese population. You know, since uh, Turkestan occupied, uh, occupied 1949, and immediately Chinese government implemented the population transport to this area. Because Chinese government is the one policy towards the Uyghur, Tibet, so then Mongolian people has never changed. It is the assimilation policy. So, uh, 1949, when East Turkestan has been occupied, that time, whole total uh, uh, population of the China, Chinese people in East Turkestan just 4%, 4 or 5%. Uyghur uh, population 85%, another 10% is different of Kazakh and some other uh, ethnic minorities there. Since uh, 71 years past, uh, no, uh, the official number of the Chinese government, uh, uh, Uyghur population is 45%, uh, Chinese population 42%. Uh, but in reality, we don't know how many real, real and because Chinese government systematically population transport one side, other side, and the British control policy towards the Uyghurs. So uh, now we, we don't know exactly number and how many percent, so because it, it is impossible to get the, uh, uh, just such kind of number. As we say, uh, 2017, not at the, uh, even we don't know how many people in the concentration camp. Uh, 15, 14 of September, just uh, one month, uh, three weeks ago, Chinese government uh, published white paper, and uh, in the white paper reported saying Chinese government the first time indirect recognize uh, Chinese government and uh, put uh, uh, subjects to Uyghur to uh, uh, to uh, re education. It's the same, uh, since 2014, each year, 1.3 million Uyghurs subject to re-education. Actually, re-education is a concentration. If the calculator the number from the Chinese number, then almost since the six years, 7.8 million, nearly 
7.8 million ya nearly 8 million Uyghurs already subject to eradication. So we don't know uh, still how many is already released, how many and died, how many is transport to the other province of China, and how many and uh, died. This is the one uh, question uh, mark for us. Not all, it is impossible to what was going on the camp and what 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 uh, what kind of uh, uh, persecution and we, we know very very little information. Some uh, camp survivor already released because of the foreign citizen. Uh, now is arriving to the uh, European country, United States, Turkey. They are uh, made public uh, speak to the media, and uh, uh, then we know and the whole horrible situation here. In the Indonesian reality, uh, uh, to show the reality, Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping, and the uh, renounced religious and ethnic identity. This is the whole thing. Uh, uh, okay, uh, yeah. So uh, my time is up. Of course, so that's why in the Chinese government all the time changing narrative uh, for the uh, this, uh, persecution to the Uyghur. At the beginning, denied everything. Then, after the growing up international pressure, Chinese government this is the vocational training center. Then later, change narrative. This is fighting terrorism and radicalism. Then change that they are uh, they are released everything. But it is completely liar. Chinese government continue trying to liar, uh, continue trying to hide the reality from the internationally. And the Chinese government you know we all know and the persecution for the Uyghur and what is the government happening is Hong Kong, Tibet, and the southern Mongolia. So uh, this is not new case. So it is a time all the world should be wake up. It's the time all the human beings should be uh, take China up on board. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you so much. Uh, uh, we'll move on to Aziz. Aziz Isa Elkun, who'll start with introducing himself. Hi. Okay, I just I, I just my video camera. Okay, good. So, uh, uh, am I to be seen on the screen? Yes. On your side? We can hear you. So, okay. uh, keep your watch so that we know. Yes, I set my. Uh, yeah, I set for ten minutes. Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm very pleased to join uh, this evening's discussion this, to this panel. Uh, it's my rare opportunity uh, to share my what I am uh, thinking, what I have I have been experienced about the um, uh, uh, about the uh, the treatment by the Chinese government, uh, uh, as we call uh, the uh, coloniality and the dehumanization. So I, am, I am mostly focus on this uh, on this, uh, uh, on this topic. Uh, yes, briefly. I, before that, I briefly introduce myself. Uh, I was born in uh, Shire County uh, near Tarim River, which is uh, uh, located between Urumqi and Kashgar, right in the middle. Uh, part of Aksu Prefecture. Uh, I graduated the uh, Uyghur language school. Even uh, the, I graduated the university in Uyghur language, but I studied the uh, Russian language from uh, Xinjiang University. Uh, after uh, after my graduation, uh, of course, before I got to university or during the university, I was uh, active active uh, uh, student movement. Uh, I was a member. Uh, we were organizations, student organizations, or underground organizations, and uh, to express our our protest to the Chinese government uh, to seek uh, equal rights for the Uyghur people uh, in politics, education, and uh, and uh, social justice. Uh, after I graduated, I was fired from my job with separatism. That was in 1992. Uh, that was uh, my new life started. So I, I became uh, uh, quite struggled to stay there, and uh, it took me another nine years to to keep on live on. Uh, but uh, just uh, like uh, every Uyghurs, uh, we we've been experienced this about 30 years ago. Yes, since 2001, I've been living in in UK. Now I work as a research research affiliate for SOAS, University of London, and uh, I'm also a secretary of uh, Inter International Pan Uyghur Center. Also secretary for Ilham Tohti Institute. Uh, we've been working very hard for Uyghur scholar Ilham Tohti, uh, which uh, about six years ago Chinese government uh, 
sentence in uh, life imprisonment. And uh, yes, uh, dehumanization are part of the colonization. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, uh, every colonial power in the world. Uh, you are not up to live in this world, so you have to be kind of dehuman uh, in the colonizer's uh, point of view, politically, socially. Uh, I, I, yes, I start my uh, exact ex exact point. Uh, since 2017, I lost the uh, communication with my parents, and uh, my father was very ill. And my father died uh, in third uh, November 2000, 2017. And soon after that, I lost the uh, uh, communication telephone call with my mother. And uh, yes, like every every Uyghur, we were very sad. I tried to uh, make aware of the situation, something terribly uh, going on the wrongly. So I I wrote a. Uh, wrote a, a novel based on my own experience uh, that novel called short and uh, short story not no sh short story uh, that story called an answer telephone call then was uh, I somehow I reached my aim was uh, widely written and translated into many languages this about this uh, reflect the, uh, the situation at that time about three years ago and I turned this, this into a film, and then I, I was campaigning about this uh, something happening uh, not right, and then the uh, end of uh, 2017, we began to talk about one million Uyghurs uh, were kept uh, inside Chinese concentration camp, uh, Chinese called uh, re-education camp, or sometimes we call internment camps. So now uh, we are here now. But uh, in uh, yes, I've been doing everything I can uh, as a normal British citizen. I have absolutely I have rights to able to freely exercise my human rights. My I mean my human rights mean my own human rights. Like uh, I I should be able to speak to my mother, to my family members, to my friends. So it's uh, it's very 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 difficult uh, to to make the Chinese government understand it. You cannot uh, you cannot touch you cannot abuse uh, the the anyone's personal rights personal personal basic rights for example. Uh, and uh, so in May 2019, uh, I was very sad about the, my father. Uh, he, I was not able to go to and attend his funeral and because i am the only only child of the family that was i it, it impacted me very very deeply so in uh, may 2019 i i was i i miss the the family i tried to look at the the family pictures and uh, the the area from the google earth and i uh, suddenly discovered my father's tomb was destroyed and I calculated he was only stayed in his uh, tomb uh, 623 days. So I was very upset and I didn't think about the dehumanization of the Chinese government goes to that level, to that personal. So I thought I should uh, talk to the media. Then in January, January 2019, I gave interview for CNN. Then Chinese government responded uh, to my interview. Now, can we play the play the uh, 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 video too, please? A video clip. So clip one. Clip two, please. Clip two. Anna, you doing it or should I do it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I... Okay. Then Chinese government uh, responded. Uh, they published uh, uh, in their kind of 20 or, or 30 <laughs> websites. Uh, this is Chinese uh, CGTV network uh, video clip. Can I play it now? Yes, please, you can play now. Isa Elkun's father died. It was too dangerous for him to go to the funeral in China. This report by CNN released on January 2nd claims authorities have 
demolishing graves in China's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. It highlighted the story of Aziz Alkun, a Uyghur poet now living in the UK. What happened to your father's remains? I don't know. I don't know. I, I have no idea. After a four-hour drive from the city of Aksu in southern Xinjiang, we arrived at the house of Aziz's family and met his mother, Happy Zem, and his sister, Verlan. After a few exchanges, they took us to the place where Aziz's father, Ayah Abdullah, is now buried. Aziz's 78-year-old mother told us her husband Isa died from a heart attack back in November 2017. According to CNN, Aziz knows exactly where his father's tomb is, but due to his status, he couldn't come back or even phone his mother. But during our interview with his mom, she painted a totally different picture. <laughs> Meanwhile, CNN said his father was buried in this kind of thing. Aziz, we can't hear you. Oh, yeah. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, this is the story about my father and about his graveyard. And this is not only about my father. There's, uh, uh, there's uh, uh, estimation about uh, up to 80% of which were graveyard and the mosques were demolished. And uh, uh, this is to show uh, another level of Chinese atrocity. Uh, we called about uh, two, three years ago. This is a cultural genocide. Now it's uh, uh, no adjective for this genocide. This is just a pure genocide. And uh, yes, this is the dehumanization, of course. Uh, I cannot last watch the video myself. Uh, actually, my mother said uh, on the Chinese uh, TV, uh, she denounced me. So this is exactly how China wanted to, to do it. They, they did this denounce. Uh, dehumanization, uh, uh, putting father against the son, putting uh, daughter against the mother. That was they, they did in the, in the, during the Cultural Revolution. Now they are doing this kind of uh, propaganda, this kind of accusing the Uyghur exiles. Uh, that was became very common practice now. They started this kind of propaganda about uh, uh, two years ago. And now I want to, I want to show you another, another clip, uh, video clip too, please. Uh, yes, uh, I'm. Yes, I'm going to show you another clip. Can you stop this now? Okay, can you stop now? Okay, thank you. Uh, shall I get back to my talk? Okay, so yes, it is uh, uh, the, the level of dehumanization of Uyghurs uh, by the Chinese government. It's uh, it's uh, unpredictable. The level is uh, so disgrace, and uh, so this is part of their their their, their campaign to approve the Uyghur Uyghur. Uh, Uyghur's cultural and ethnic and religious identity. This part of Chinese uh, uh, ch Chinese uh, genocide right now taking place. Now estimated there are at least uh, uh, around uh, eight million Uyghurs now since 2014, uh, according to the Chinese uh, own report. Uh, went to the 
uh, graduated from uh, re-education school, Chinese government claimed. That was a concentration camp, and we don't know how many girls, how many thousands, hundreds, thousands of we was innocent Chinese citizen. Uh, they became a victim and died. So this is a very, very, very gross situation now. Thank you. My time is uh, end, I think. Uh, thank you so much, Aziz. I mean, this too, what's common, I and mean, you know the commonality, of course, is Dolkun and your stories of suffering, families being divided. So it's more than simply camps, it's more than occupation, operation. It's very much also human stories and human stories of tragedy. So we'll move on to David next. Yeah. David, oh, start with the introduction, please. Okay. Hello everyone, thank you for the invite. It's a very exciting event to be involved in. Um, you're really very lucky if you're studying at Westminster, uh, getting to hear about such exciting things at this stage in your studies. Um, my name is David Tobin, I'm a research fellow in the political economy of China at the University of Manchester. I just published my first book with Cambridge called Securing China's Northwest Frontier, Identity and Insecurity in Xinjiang. Essentially, I spent a couple of years, two or three years living in the Rumchi, um, where I essentially studied patriotic education manuals for cadres and ethnic unity education texts for children and students. And then I interviewed uh, Han, both Han and Uyghurs about what they thought about the narratives of identity and security in, in these texts. Essentially, my argument in the book is that Securitizing identity, making identity a security matter, created in more insecurity in the region than there was before. It made Uyghurs feel insecure because their identity, being Turkic and Islamic, was considered un-Chinese. So this has been the threat. So they view the state as an assimilative colonial power. But it also made Han insecure because they assume many assumed that Uyghurs, any sign of Uyghur dissatisfaction, was an act of terrorism. So essentially, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy of insecurity uh, that made no one, no one, no one feel happy. And those were very tough times. That was 2009, after the mass violence between Han and Uyghurs. But looking back, those seem like like better times than now. To turn to today's topic, I mean, I think one of the issues and come up comes up and hangs over how to understand these issues are that we all are living in fairly dehumanising times. COVID-19 and state responses, we're seeing creeping authoritarianism, um, the, the reality of the economic inequality and how that shapes our lives is having a dramatic impact on us, and many people feel superfluous, that their lives don't matter. Um, and it's this, in reading Hannah Arendt's notion of the totalitarian movement, the, the core of it is that humans are made to be superfluous. Um, and this is a form of nihilism, where everything is permitted. And we're seeing this now, where even the leader of the United States doesn't seem to care even for their own lives, let alone the people's. Um, all, all, of course, in the times of fascism, um, this was all because of the direction of history. Individuals don't necessarily matter. What matters is, is the nation and, and national destiny. And that's some of that actually plays out in Chinese politics today. We're living at times where you'll all be familiar with slogans and campaigns about Black Lives Matter and, of course, the sort of knee-jerk response that all lives matter. Um, the similar, this sort of knee-jerk response is, is similar to the ambivalent type of response we've heard around the world to Uyghur calls for self-determination um, or more cultural recognition that don't always resonate um, in liberal democracies where we take some of those things for granted. And they also resonate in Han Chinese responses in Xinjiang to weaker claims of oppression, saying, we're all oppressed. We're all living under authoritarian state. Why do you deserve special treatment? So this, I see this as a form of nihilism, it's cynicism, that we're all under surveillance, we're all mm -hmm. oppressed, we're all unrepresented. And it's true, we live in times where, in many senses, no lives matter. But some lives matter less than others. Some are more dehumanized, some are under more surveillance, and some are less represented than others. Uyghurs and Xinjiang's indigenous peoples have really struggled to be heard in an era of binarizing binary culture wars, 
many activists have responded to those, that type of binary debate with the hashtag Me Too, Uyghur, and Uyghur Lives Matter. Um, they, many Uyghur activists and people who write about this topic, encounter dismissals from both the left and the right. Um, communist or socialist groups in across Europe will often refer uh, to this problem as as, or sorry, to Uyghurs as a reactionary force, um, and, and calls from the right dismiss them as terrorists or it's real politic. Um, all states do these things. Both reflect a global nihilism that actual human lives don't matter in the direction of history. Um, different directions, but still the same type of nihilism. And of course, Uyghurs are targeted as a group, not simply as individuals. We've seen the disappearance of most Uyghur intellectuals, leading cultural figures, but of course. Camps and intergenerational separation affect all Uyghurs, and the the cases that we know, the evidence we have, the reasons given to people for being put in camps are clearly about their group identity, being too Turkic or too Islamic. Essentially, they don't fit into the party's direction of history towards the great revival. What Xi Jinping calls the great revival of the Chinese people, where the Chinese culture is unified, and in his words, culture is the soul of the nation, um, which is a massive policy shift away from recognition of 56 ethnic groups. Um, so we see this in though, that type of language. You see that in, ex in explanations of internment and intergenerational separation that focus on the notion of Uyghurs having a fake identity. Um, it's a colonial manipulation uh, that makes them see themselves as Turk and Islamic instead of Chinese. And, and the camps are seen as, in according to state council documents, this will solve the ethnic problem forever. But of course, Uyghur activists' responses don't necessarily fit easily into the culture war binary. Uh, most are called to end repression of language and religion, um, essentially to be included as human, um, which is it's not conservative in the sense that it seeks change, but it's not radical either. It doesn't seek revolution, it's purely to be recognized as human. And you heard this from Dulcan and Aziz using the language of human rights, both focusing on wanting simply to see their family. Most Uyghur calls um, of dissatisfaction in China focus on cultural recognition. Okay. So, and another thing that hangs over this is, of course, where to fit Xinjiang in the world, what, what type of place is it? It's, it's a place marked by in between this. James Millward, of course, calls Xinjiang's history a Eurasian crossroads where many civilizations have passed through. Um, Silk Road, obviously, that you'll know about. Um, and also, many empires have converged in the region <laughs> to try and control um, different parts of it throughout history. And of course, Uyghur identities, in a sense, in between its Central Asian identity, either East Asian or Western, it's somewhere in between. And of course, China is also in between. It sees itself, the CCP certainly sees China as a, an anti-hegemonic force in its language. It's anti-colonization. It's going to reverse colonization around the world. It's going to bring more global equality. Um, but of course, China is only semi-colonized. Even in, in the sort of Western philosophical imagination, such as Immanuel Kant, he always framed China as in between the cultureless tropics, the savagery and the anarchy of Africa in between that and Western civilizations. So it's always been difficult to try and understand China and its place in world order, but also how that world order affects people within its borders. China's post-colonial, in, in reference to the West, calls it national humiliation, the opium war, but it's also post-colonial in reference to itself. It was, it was its own empire using the notion of Hua Yi, um, Civilization and barbarism. You didn't have different ethnic groups. You simply had Chinese civilization or barbarians. Um, that in Fei Tong's words, are new blood for the Han. They're they are to be assimilated. But that process of assimilation is seen as benevolent. It's a form of inclusion. Of course, this is not what those so-called barbarians think. But that's the way it's presented. And of course, it depends where we start. If we start at you know, from Europe in 1949, it looks like China's anti-colonial. It's a socialist state. It wants to change world order. But of course, if you look within China, the, the sort of Republican Revolution that, that 
sparked the events that led to the communist revolution called Manchu, the race of Tartar dogs, um, of, alien, of Tartar origins, not Chinese. Um, and of course, peaceful liberation of the region uh, is described in the party state's documents. Of course, we know that up to the 1950s, the party state or the PLA were still actually fighting with Kazakh, uh, what were called Kazakh bandits in, in the north of Xinjiang. If we start in 1759, though, we see this is an ex we see an expansion of empire when the, the Manchu arrived in Xinjiang and these territories that, that were acquired during this imperial expansion that went to Mongolia, to Tibet, to Xinjiang, these territories were retained and they're never truly seen as Chinese. They're always seen as, as frontiers. Um, the very name, of course, Xinjiang, New Frontier. And then today, okay, so the China and the US, the way most people view international relations, these two superpowers, yes, there's still an asymmetrical relations, um, but why assume that there's only one empire or only one form of empire? In any other context, describing multiple forms of empire is, is not controversial, or saying that not there were empires before modern Europe, that, that's not a controversial statement. And of course, referring to China in that manner, it is deemed controversial. The party state's notion has a teleological notion, meaning its history has a direction, it's purposeful, um, and that's seen in, in its language, it's, it's about surpassing the West. You see that in the documents on One Belt, One Road. Um, but it's, a, it's an anti-colonial teleology. Um, it's that the world will become more equal and less colonial with China's rise. Of course, this depends on colonization of its own diverse frontiers history, not just people now, but their whole history. Of course, under uh, the, during the communist period, China was considered constituted by 56 ethnic groups. It wasn't like the West. It didn't believe in assimilation. But now, of course, China is defined as through 5,000 years of history. Zhonghua Minzu is, is timeless. And all people within China are now considered part of Zhonghua Minzu. Yen Boazan in the 1950s, Chinese anthropologists described this narrative of 5,000 years of history as Western assimilation. And he says in the 50s, if we pursue that policy, if we pursue that way of thinking, we'll become like the West. Um, whereas when we look to, to what's happening now, of course, it, it very much resembles colonialism, as we've heard from Aziz and Bill Kuhn. Um, but the party states can, continues to describe problem they explained violence in 2009 as a, as, a, as a life or death struggle for China's survival, but it's, it's really caused by the colonial manipulations of Uyghur's identity. Quote, they are not a Turkic Minzo, they are not a Turkic group, they are not an Islamic group. Only terrorists would say they are a Turkic group or an Islamic group. Of course, this is why Uyghurs feel insecure, because the state tells them their identity is actually a threat to the, to the integrity of the state um, and its power. And we saw this in the 2012 intergenerational debate on ethnic policy that really was, it, it was a debate um, between one side historical materialists saying economic development will solve the ethnic problem and social engineers like Huang Gang um, or, and Ma Rong saying that we, can, that we can teach minorities to be Chinese, we teach barbarians to be Chinese. So both sides of the debate were about wanted assimilation. We we're really just arguing about different methods to get there. And this, this same language is used in explanations of camps and intergenerational separation. Um, it's described as a window of opportunity, quote, while the West is in decline, um, but also a critical stability period that while China goes out in the One Belt, One Road project, it also must resolve the ethnic problem forever. In the state's perspective, Xinjiang is an internal affair. Um, all discussion is framed as intervention and actually a form of colonialism. Um, but it also relates to Xinjiang as, an ex as, an, as something external, the very name. It's a frontier, it's a new frontier. Um, you go back in time to the Republican era debates, they called, the, once the Republican revolution succeeded, they said, we have five races. What, they're not Chinese. How do we assimilate them or do we let them go? Mao Zedong referred to entering Xinjiang as part of a geopolitical chess game. He referred to Uyghurs as 
the core ethnic group of Xinjiang. You would not hear of that now. Um, it was seen in geopolitical terms and only gradually shifted towards the cultural nationalism we see today. Um, of course, China is traditionally defined by the party state as non-Western. It uses a fraction, not assimilation and nationalism. Um, like I said, Faisal Tong refers to this form of attraction as new blood for the hands. This is very racial logics. Um, our own calls it teaching barbarians to be Chinese. Another factor that sort of clouds debates on this is if we are to call this issue genocide, it's something, it, it doesn't resemble every, all form, other forms of genocide. There are different forms of genocide, like different forms of empire. And one thing that's somewhat different about this case from, say, um, ethnic cleansing in the former Yugoslavia based on you know, troops arriving in a village and trying to expel people, scare them to leave, the party state is attempting to violently include Xinjiang as its and its peoples. Um, language policy and religious restrictions, um, these are about converting people, not just annihilating them. Um, now, this has been framed as internal colonialism by Drew Gladney, emphasising that it parallels British history, the expansion um, into the Celtic fringe, as they call it, to extract resources, to make the centre richer. Uh, Lisa Shine calls it internal Orientalism, the Uyghurs are seen as backward, um, but they're still internal to China, they can't leave. Of course, if you speak to people in Xinjiang, they don't use the terminology internal, they see it as an external colonial power. All my interviewees would use terms of like assimilation, even fascism and dehumanisation. Many would use um, the metaphor that's from a famous song, The Uninvited Guest. Um, about the guest who does who arrives and stays too long and does not reciprocate. Um, a good friend, when turned down for a house um, on the grounds that she was Uyghur, um, said ethnic unity is like rubbing my warm cheek on their cold ass. To say we have, we are trying to integrate, we speak Chinese, um, but we are still not being genuinely included. On language policies that have been since 2004, we've had a formal policy of monolingual education. Uyghurs responded saying in interviews to me, saying they want to assimilate us. They want to assimilate us slowly. We are dying. We are a dying Turkic nation and a Chinese nation state. Um, when my friend was, after the 2009 violence, um, the state employed Han volunteers because there wasn't enough security services. They would search you when you go on a bus or in a public space, a weaker friend would say, why are Han not being searched? Um, and, and my friend, when searched on a bus quite aggressively, her response was to ask me, are we not human? So just to conclude, um, CCP's genocidal practices are, of course, in the name of anti-colonialism, uh, but really it's based on, this, on a similar nihilist vision of national progress. And, ability to use state violence to eliminate problems, essentially peoples. Um, but this resembles the West in its own narratives, assimilative and colonial. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So well. uh, thank you so much, David. Uh, thanks to all three speakers. In fact, uh, what I'll do is I have a question for you, but I'll keep it reserved in case no one else asks. So now the floor is open. I mean, anyone who has a question or a comment, you can raise your hand or you could just uh, start speaking. Yeah, raise your hand and then I'll uh, call you out and then you can uh, start speaking. Anyone have a question? I said the question can be for one speaker or all three speakers. Yeah, Elena, please go ahead. Give me a second. Elena should be able to speak. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so she's writing. Just a second. So the question is Could COVID 19 be a deviation from the whole world to distract us from analyzing what China is doing to Muslim people because it's too dangerous for the economy of the whole world to go against China, especially now? So, um, so thanks, Elena. So the question I would, from, apart from the way she has phrased the question, I would say to what extent the whole pandemic and COVID 19 and the dependence of international community in different countries on China economically is tempering down 
a criticism of China. Who would like to take the question first? Uh, should we start with Dolkun? Well, it is a good question, of course. And the COVID-19, uh, uh, actually Chinese government, uh, it is uh, now, it is COVID-19, yes. Now it is threatened to the uh, millions of people's life. So many people have died and, uh, uh, globally. Uh, this is the should be human beings should get the lesson uh, from the get experience from this because Chinese government uh, how terrible for the human being Chinese Communist Party uh, why why because this dictator regime is Chinese Communist Party hiding the reality uh, not sharing the information block the information. Uh, if Chinese government CCP sharing inf uh, information to, uh, on time and cooperate with international cooperation on time, maybe on time controls the pandemic and less people uh, die than no. Uh, because China is this, is this COVID uh, uh, happening in China is the beginning of October, November, and the whole the world know it is beginning of the January or end of the December. At least two or three months, Chinese government hiding the reality, don't share that information. Uh, that then it is this is spread around the world. Uh, yeah, so Chinese government has never fighting against the COVID coronavirus. Chinese government continually fighting against the truth. This is the terrible situation. So that's the important part. No, but the human being to get to listen. And even you know, Chinese government and the same uh, last last the, the, the information on the Uyghurs of COVID-19, 16 of February. Chinese government and the, up to 16 of February is this and the give, and give didn't give any update information until uh, 16 of February saying 76 people infection infected in 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 East Turkestan, Xinjiang. Uh, then three is uh, uh, died. Then a couple of weeks later, all recovery. But and uh, neighboring of this Turkestan for the Xinjiang, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, so many people died. This pandemic are arriving to the, the Latin America, around the world, Africa, every country. But and the neighboring of the country, but is zero case was happening in the Turkestan, Xinjiang. It's how possible? That time we are warning the world saying if one uh, one virus spread to the camp because and the condition of the camp is uh, terrible, some very easily to spread and it will be a disaster. So that's why we warn the whole world. Then Chinese government and suddenly is July up to four five five months later suddenly locked up all whole of home. Even don't give the opportunity to people buying something, buying food, uh, water. Just give the two hours time. Uh, I think 20 or 14 of July, saying you have only two hours time. Do you have to buy something? Then and the, and the police just uh, close the, all the door and they just uh, and lock the door. Not a lot of people come out. Still, it is one question. Even some people also already died in the. Because of the, not only COVID infection for COVID of 19, even people died of hunger, hungry. So this is the situation. So COVID 19. Uh, so I would like to say, uh, world and uh, even every country, every human being affected for the economically, physically, and the healthy. Uh, now and uh, if China is continue growing up the uh, 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 first uh, economic. Power uh, 20 late, uh, 15, late, 15 years or 20 years later, uh, we have to think in double what kind of world will be living human being. Today is China is because use economic power trying to monopolize the UN human rights system, monopolize uh, World Health Organization, monopolize to other international institution, and the, this is the result today we have seen how terrible the Chinese Communist Party. So that's why this is the good point. Every human being, every country must be getting some lesson from this. Thank you. Aziz, you want to add anything? I'm in fact, I, yes. 
Yeah, if, if Aaron, I'll, I'll add a question to, for you here, right? To what extent, I mean, when you look at the UK phones. Yes, yes how, I... Yeah, so how much solidarity is there in the UK for what's happening to Uyghurs? So what have you found here? Yeah, so if you could add to that also. Uh, yes, uh, it's... Uh, uh, yes, uh, UK government is uh, paying attention. This is uh, very pleasing us now. And uh, we have been hearing uh, lots of... Uh, uh, lots of positive news from the parliament and the 12th of uh, October this month there will be another debate on the parliament uh, with uh, this part, uh, UK going to uh, uh, going to uh, apply sanction on uh, or, or Uyghur genocide uh, so this is very positive uh, trend and the, and France also now people in France also waking up now. French government also going, I think, going to do same thing. So only about uh, the, the in, if you say about Europe wise now, so Germany must do something else. This is only the the one uh, lack of response from Germany at the moment. So what I want to say at the, uh, the, the, the uh, I want to make two points about general question. One, world must take account take account on China. China, China must be accountable about this pandemic. There's no transparency whatsoever. This, this exactly same this, uh, kind of uh, pandemic happened. Oh, the, 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 the different types of pandemic. The SARS happened in 2003, and now 2019. And now there's a uh, Australia, Australia, and uh, many UN member states now calling China to uh, to give transparent, accountable of the pandemic. And about the Uyghur genocide, this is part of the whole whole set. China, China uh, world shouldn't be afraid of this uh, pandemic, and we should uh, we should uh, more concern about the economic uh, economic uh, connection with China. Uh, this is totally wrong. We shouldn't let the world imposed by China, China's authoritarianism. Now look at Central Asian states. Look at the East Asian states. Now everywhere about the uh, Chinese uh, surveillance technology, Chinese style of uh, surveillance, uh, break uh, the interference, uh, personal freedom. Uh, we, uh, the, the the free people of the world, we shouldn't, our government shouldn't allow China to extend this authoritarianism, this this uh, this uh, uh, this kind of uh, 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 the, the awful system to the world. So it's not about uh, about. Coronavirus. The, the governments must stop. Shouldn't be afraid of about the, the losing the, the economic benefit or cooperation uh, uh, with China. Okay, and David, uh, so in, again, if you could respond to that question, if you would, do you want to add to anything to this? Yeah, just briefly, um, I'll just say that. Yes, COVID obviously is a distraction. It, that doesn't mean it's a conspiracy or it was planned out this way. Um, but of course, it does distract us all because it threat it could threaten us all, um, and that's it distracts us all in in some understandable ways where we're you know we're all having to adapt our lives and go through stress. But of course, it does make it can make people more selfish because we're focusing on ourselves and survival and ignoring bigger picture or issues that don't necessarily directly affect us on a daily basis. Um, so I try to have some sympathy um, for that distraction, but also to warn against it, that we do need to pay attention to the world at large and to other issues. Um, if it was, I mean, it, leaders are obviously different states are, you know, using different tactics and using different narratives to explain their national culture, as it were. Um, you know, Boris Johnson saying we're a freedom-loving people and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, I mean, China really, I mean, obviously, most op-eds and most government statements just related this to the Great Revival and said China will sail through this and the West will suffer and all that stuff. But, of course, the Pew survey that came out today has found that China's opinions on China have plummeted into negatives that were positives. So it hasn't worked very well. Um, one thing I will say, and it, it did distract, detract, and distract specifically from Xinjiang, was while media, certainly in the UK, was emphasising that China was coming out of COVID, out of lockdown, was going back to normal, as it were. It was ignoring that in Xinjiang, that was at that time was when things were being locked down very rapidly. 
And if you look at the League of Human Rights Project report on the impact of COVID, it's very difficult to get information out, but certainly people were posting videos online saying we have no food, um, we've been locked down immediately with no notification and we have no food. The world did not pay attention to that. Okay. So we have got three questions. I'll put them together for the panel, right? The three panel and I'll add another question of mine. So let me ask the question, right? And this is all connected to, let's say, the Muslim identity of Uyghurs. To what extent, if I'm um, the question like, if Uyghurs are not Muslim, do you think the world would have paid more attention or less attention? So to what extent Muslim identity is many Uyghurs plays a crucial role here? And how is that connected to and what's happening to Uyghurs today? Connected to 9-11, post 9-11, what China did. So if you all could say a bit about 9-11, Islamophobia, China, and your identity as Muslim. And second broad question is about what can world do about Uyghurs? There are two things, and I'll add to it. I'll add to it you know, related to the UN General Assembly and the letters. So trying to look for the letter, the list of countries that supported China. You know, 39 countries oppose China. Turkey opposed China, but separately, not as part of 39. And 45 countries have supported China on Xinjiang and 55 on. And when you will look at the list, most of the countries are, half of the countries will be Islamic Republic of one or the other kind. So if you take example of 2019, we notice that the opposite side, right, on various things. You've got Iran, Saudi Arabia, Syria, UAE, Pakistan, Algeria, all of them supporting China explicitly, right? So these are the facts. So if you could start, and maybe you'll start this time again, if you could say a bit about Muslim identity, what extent role it plays, why is the world silent, and why are Muslim countries so un so careless about you? In fact, they support China clearly, that's one. Second, what can the world do? Yeah, Dolkun, you want to start? Yeah, volume, we can't hear you, your microphone, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, as you said, yeah, uh, yesterday was uh, 39 country uh, sent a joint statement. Uh, among them, only two, only two Muslim country. One is Albania, one is Bosnia, and uh, uh, Turkey separately made a statement. This is a good step. Uh, yeah, but 2019, uh, first time, 22 country made joint statement and asked Chinese government to close this concentration. That time, no single Muslim country among the 22. Latest three countries joined that 25, no Muslim country, but opposite, 50 country, Chinese government encouraged 50 country and the support the Chinese policy towards the Uyghur Muslim. Among them, 16 Muslim country. Majority Muslim nation all signed uh, to support China. Egypt, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, all country, yes. Uh, yeah, so this is the big shame, you know. Uh, but at least this time, among them, uh, three is of some, this 39 country, it is two is a Muslim country. No, it's at least three Muslim countries support all, all cause. Actually, Chinese government start uh, war against Islam. CCP, Chinese Communist Party, is the fundamental uh, base is against the religious, any religious, against the Christian, against the Muslim, against the Buddhist. All the group, all the religious people is suffering by the CCP. So many Christian church was destroyed. And recently, ASPI report saying, since 2017, 8,000 the most completely destroyed. 8,000. Because they yeah, used the satellite image, used the Chinese, uh, Chinese resource, saying 8,000 the most completely destroyed. 8,000 the most Partly dis destroyed, altogether 16 mosques is destroyed. Chinese government collected Quran 2017, burning Quran. And all the religious book, all the religious texts, even uh, prime math also collected and burning it. But, and also CCP were openly saying, 
Islam is an ideological illness. It must be eradicated. So Chinese government, yes, we are because we are one of the because we are Muslim because we are Uyghur because that's why Chinese government implemented ethnic genocide today. This is the completely genocide. But unfortunately, most of some Islamic country world continue silent. Even not only silent, support Chinese policy. This is an unacceptable situation. Today, China attack to Uyghur and time attack value of the universal value. Quran. Even today, we cannot give the name of the name to our children. This is the so many media reported and so many independent published report. Uh, so no no excuse to silence. Unfortunately, today and we have seen some country woke up and some Islamic society, Islamic uh, uh, civil societies uh, and woke up to and the, and the support to the us. But most of some country, Islamic country. Silent, even not silent, some is majority support Chinese repression policy. Yeah, it's a big shame today. So it is not a religious issue. This is the today is the most of them who support to us now. It is Jewish, Jewish uh, community, you know, and the uh, uh, students. And today it is the Uyghur issue, not a religious issue. Not just the it, 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 this is the really humanity issue. So all the people, all the human being must be because Second World War after all the human and the world says never again. Never again is happening again today. So that's why, yes, China, but China, one side, used because we are Muslim. That's why China using this argument, ha, I'm, I'm fighting terrorism and the radicalism. Very easy because we are Muslim, very easy to label the terrorists. Before the September 11, Chinese government never blamed Uyghur activism as a terrorist. That just a separatism and the religious fundamentalism, something that like. But at September 11, and the, and the Chinese government immediately changed language. Within one night, we are being terrorists. And my name of the number three of the terrorists of Chinese list, 2003 Chinese government issued big list. 11 people for Uyghur organization exile as a terrorist. My name on the list still told this, so that's why I'm suffering 21 years for the Interpol red notes. But I'm fighting my right. Finally, 2018, uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, my red notes was delayed. But China used this argument, trying to destroy us and uh, trying to kill the Uyghur people. Uh, but however, most of the country is to support us. This is the Western country, democratic Western democracy country. Yeah, but unfortunately, uh, Muslim country continue silence. We hope one day they will wake up. Thank you, thank you, Dolkun, because this does raise a question of whole notion of Ummah, whole notion of there being a Muslim world where Muslim people take care of each other. Because we see the example that that in this case of China, this, that it seems that burning of Quran is seen as something very bad, unless China does it, in which case it's seen as acceptable. That's what the world forgives. Anyway, Aziz, you want to go next, please? Uh, you want to add uh, anything? Uh, yes, uh, yes. I, yes, I, 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 I make a few points about this. Yes, uh, we are, uh, the Dolkan also said, we are Muslim. Uh, uh, whole world now we are Muslim, we are Sunni Muslim. But uh, we are also, ethnically, we are Turkish people. And we have nothing to, to share with the Han Chinese majority in China. That's also uh, the, the problem, a Chinese point of view. And uh, yes, uh, I said uh, my, uh, during my presentation uh, when we started this panel, I was fired from my official job with spread some charges. That was 1992. As soon as uh, the September 11 started, China adopted its policy because before that, uh, in in the 1990s, they uh, they they called any Uyghur intellectuals or any dissident movement they called him deadly with the separatism or splitism. And 1950s, Chinese uh, called us uh, called the Uyghur movement pan-Turkism. And now after 2000, 
they adopted its policy with the uh, LGBT with the US and uh, with the West, and this perfect opportunity for for China. And uh, there's a lot of debate about the US role, how Uyghur China China used to the Uyghurs as a, a part of the uh, global war, war in on terror. Even in 2011, soon after the uh, September 11 uh, terror attack uh, in New York, even the U.S. government listed one of the one single, is uh, a single organization called Eastern Islamic Movement. Even that organization actually does not exist anymore. And now, even until now, Chinese government claimed Eastern is uh, at the terror. Label with her name. Is Turkestan geographically, politically, name of the uh, country's uh, name of the Uyghur, Uyghur state, Uyghur Republic, which we, we established in 1933, 1944, Republic of East Turkestan. This is a, a, a geographical landscape and also uh, for the Uyghurs, this is a political meaning. And this is the this is op op opportunity provided by whom? Uh, by by U.S. policy, and now U.S. Uh, uh, began to understand uh, uh, true aim of uh, of the uh, Chinese government. I know it's already already too late. I don't know how how even many 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 bill pass on the uh, uh, U.S. U.S. Senate uh, how, will will it it will affect will it will solve the problem? I don't think so. I, I don't know how the the world. Well, must help this Ukraine. This is nothing, something about this. is not about Islam. It's not about the war on terror. This is about the, about the differences, about the territory, about the differences, about culture, cultural clash, about colon, colonization. This is problems exist at hundreds of years ago, exist about ten years ago, and exist and still now. So this is all about war on terror, about Islam, radicalism. All just like a, a disguised uh, political uh, tool for the Chinese government. Thank you. In terms of uh, David, uh, you could add anything you want, and I'll add a question which Greg asked uh, there in the chat, which is that I mean, what explains what China is doing now, right? So, I mean, as uh, you all have said, that what's happening is not new. I mean, this is part and parcel of the broader colonization project of China and uh, with the way we Uyghurs, so that's there, right? So, the separatism thing was there even in the past. Maybe it has become more, less increased at this point. But what explains the current stage of oppression? Is it driven by CCP's insecurity, or is it more to do with China's geopolitical ambition? If you want to address that, along with anything else you want, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, really. On, I mean, I'll deal with the issue firstly on the role of Muslim identity. Um, yeah, the tactic, the shift after 9-11 was very rapid and it was a tactical shift where all the official documents that described the violence of the 1990s, um, it really, it used to describe that as separatism. Um, but after, I think it's like one month after 9-11 in October, um, they published a document, uh, East Turkestan forces cannot get away with impunity. And it reframed all the political violence of the 1990s as extremism, um, as terrorism. But, but that language was never used before 9-11. So clearly that enabled this shift. Um, but it, it doesn't cause it doesn't cause the strategy to convert the region or modernize the region as was described or modernization is a term used in the regional autonomy laws written in the 1950s um so i really see that as an enabling factor and a, a, a tactical shift um i mean the etim was mentioned a group we didn't really have much information of well, sean roberts has written about this um but what I found interesting trying to interview people in Xinjiang was that the word for East Turkestan, which is the name of the region that Aziz and Al Kun are using instead of Xinjiang, of course, um, Dongtu in Chinese is East Turkestan, but Dongtu is also Etim. So you can't even use the word East Turkestan without implying terrorism. Of course, this is about Turkestan. It's not simply about Islam. It's about cultural difference that Uyghurs are seen as from a different cultural civilization and they have to be converted. It doesn't, I mean, I don't think, I mean, it's, this is not downplaying the attacks on Islam. 
and it's not saying Islamophobia is not very important there, um, but it doesn't explain everything that's happening. It doesn't explain attacks on every aspect of, of Uyghur identity, of, of removing Uyghur language um, from the curriculum. It doesn't explain the three news campaigns where cadres would inspect Uyghur homes and change the furniture to be more Chinese. And of course, they would remove if you had pictures of um, from Saudi Arabia or so forth. These would be removed. But it also removed totally innocuous things, uh, stupas, the, tape, the type of table platform that Uyghurs would have in their in central courtyard room. They would they'd remove these to replace them with with furniture that is seen as Chinese. That's not about Islamophobia. Um, also, it doesn't explain why these. I mean, you've seen what? Well, also, it doesn't explain policies in Tibet since 1949 or 55. Um, it doesn't explain why the language policies are now being applied um, in Inner Mongolia. Um, my colleague David Stroop writes about how Islamophobic policies are being applied to Hui Muslims, are gradually being rolled out across China. Um, so it's in there, um, but, but there's more going on than that. Um, I mean, really, why is this happening? It is, it is difficult to answer that in the sense of why specific policies are happening. I try to focus on the strategy, not the tactics. Um, obviously, if you look at the party state's documents, um, they will say, well, there's this uptick of violence in 2009, and we had to do something about it. So we had the intergenerational policy debate, then there was more violence in 2014, 2015 mainly revolving around cadre home visits um, and sort of patrolling of neighbourhoods. Um, but of course, that doesn't ex explain um, why perceive violence between two ethnic groups as a problem of Xinjiang's backwardness and Uyghur identity. Um, it's that pre-existing racist lens that interpreted that violence as a problem of identity. Um, so I really think, I mean, what came up after 2009 was the notion that something must change, this hasn't worked, that Xi Jinping is seen as resolving the contradictions in ethnic policy, stopping focus on economic development, that was seen as the resolution to ethnic difference, and focusing on security and social engineering. Um, so he's really seen as resolving this problem in this forever. Um, but the, le the, the need to do this at all, <laughs> you know, the, the, the very fact, why see difference as a problem? Why see violence in terms of cultural difference? Um, for me, it represents a disappointment on, within the official policy establishment and leading Chinese thinkers who express real disappointment that, you know, they want to convert Uyghurs, they want to assimilate, they think China's a benevolent, attractive civilization. Civilization. Why wouldn't they want to be Chinese? Um, so sort of disappointment that Uyghurs did not convert, that you know, they really are a Turkic and Islamic group, generally speaking. <laughs> and this is why they're having to say you're not a Turkic group, you're not an Islamic group, because they really know that this, these types of identities persist, language and religion, are not practices that disappear um, rapidly. Uh, this is something that persists, um, and it's something that Marx's theory doesn't do well. It just doesn't deal with cultural politics and identity very well. Um, it just assumes uh, quite like modernization theory of liberals that identities are ephemeral and just rapidly disappear when you have urbanization and education. But of course, they don't. So I really see this as a sort of cycle. It's this, this securitization of identity. Um, it is really an ongoing cycle. It was always seen as a problem of modernization for China. Um, but really now, with the notion of shifting from 56 ethnic groups to one group, Zhongba Minzo, the Chinese nation, this means that any expression of cultural difference is viewed as terrorism. So it's created this insecurity. Um, not that there wasn't insecurity and violence in the region, um, but it's exacerbated it. Um, it's come between two groups and it's told one group that their identity is a problem and the other group that their identity is a source of stability and security for the region. Thank you. So, 
fact, a couple of more questions and final comments. So I'll give each one of you around one minute each to then give uh, your answers. So the questions that remain are two. One is around, I mean, uh, Iran pointed out that while Islamic, or oh, sorry, Muslim majority countries and the leaders might not support Uyghurs and uh, they might support China, but there's a lot of uh, support for Uyghurs or sympathy for Uyghurs amongst common population. What's your view on that? And Amina raised the question of uh, specifically uh, Uyghurs and Kashmiris. In fact, my colleague Natasha Paul, she wrote an article on Kashmir and Xinjiang yesterday. So in both of this, the idea is what does it tell us about international politics of solidarity where we find China claiming to be supporting and India not openly criticizing, but sometimes expressing sympathy with what's happening to Uyghurs when we find India doing something in Kashmir which is similar to what China is doing in Xinjiang. So on that, those questions and where, in your view, where should we hold, get hope from, given how powerful China is, right, and how China is still rising, where do you get hope from? So any final comments? We'll start with Dolkun again. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> So first uh, question, uh, yeah, is Islamic country is, uh, as we say, uh, continue silent? The reason is uh, that we have to separate and the uh, civilian and the government because uh, there is a several of reason why Islamic country continue with China. Most imp important reason is economic interest, economic reason, because this most of some country depend on the Chinese market, Chinese money. This is the most important uh, reason. I think my personal uh, view. Second, the important thing is this, most of them, this country is also very corrupted uh, government. Most of them leader is very dictator. Uh, some um, uh, dictatorship, this is the common value is the CCP and some of them, uh, most of uh, some of them Islamic uh, government today. So uh, I don't believe this the government uh, really representative the, uh, for the civilian uh, because we uh, we we know that no uh, so many civil society uh, some uh, uh, some uh, Muslim, uh, people, people, people civilian people really sympathize to the Uyghurs. Recently, we have so many uh, in the Pakistan uh, some civil society, India and uh, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Turkey. And Iraq, I mean, so many Muslim uh, countries, is a Muslim society, civil society, very sympathized. We uh, talk to us, we ask us how we can help. Yeah, so that's why uh, this is civilian, then the government is different things. Because the civil society uh, has not strong enough power in this country, dictator country, like China is also, no civil society at all. But some Muslim countries have civil society, but no power. So that's why we never lost our hope. We at least we try to work with Congress, with the organization, continue to cooperate with civil society in that country and the Islamic organization in the exam. The UK, Germany, United States, Hamas. This is the way. Yeah. Uh, and the, for the uh, second, what is the second question? It, it was about uh, what would you say about, let's say, China, which is oppressing Uyghurs, claims to have sympathy for Kashmir or at least supports Pakistan. Okay. Kashmir. And India, which yeah. is, then sometimes, not often, but would say things a bit critical of China. Yeah. Yeah. For the Pakistan issue, sometimes the Chinese government used this issue and against India. Pakistan also. Uh, I don't think the Pakistan in the China is the really uh, uh, honest for this Kashmir issue. Uh, Pakistan is Imran Khan. Uh, all the time and talking of the Kashmir issue, just use against India, against India. But if some he he, he just last the uh, United Nations uh, General Assembly, Imran Khan also made a strong statement and the uh, and some of you, you know. But we are never in the neighbor of the Pakistan. Is the neighbor of the Pakistan, we have a long historical relationship with India people, Pakistan people. But so far, in, in Pakistan is a very strong support of the China. As you see, yesterday was the uh, uh, Pakistan, on behalf of the 15 country, support China, UN uh, General Assembly. And so far, so many, at least three or four times, internationally, BBC, Deutsche Welle, 
Alcizeriya korrespondent hadi interview with Imran Khan aslında Uygur işi o da tayinli gibi same same answer. Same o I don't know this issue. Hollywood don't know this issue. All the series, all the international media report on this. O all the time and there is so many inter, uh, independent uh, experts talking on this issue you, and the, Imran Khan all the time I don't know this issue. Actually he depends on Chinese because one belt one road CPEC China Pakistan economic corridor is 62 billion dollars money so Pakistan cannot and uh, say anything so that's why all the time uh, Pakistan is the support of China is the partner of the Uyghur genocide unfortunately yeah thank you for that and then uh, Aziz any concluding remarks could keep it brief please I, 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 I turned on. Okay. Yes, I start about uh, uh, the, the yes uh, the, about uh, why there's a lack of uh, support from the from Islamic world, some uh, Muslim country. Uh, actually, yes, we can say uh, uh, Muslim country, but uh, actually these countries are not really. <laughs> A kind of uh, uh, sherry uh, or a kind of re, uh, uh, the, uh, the system of Islam. So it is uh, quite a general term, probably out of date already. We shouldn't call the any country the Islam or or Muslim country. This, is, for example, Turkey or Pakistan, for example, they have a, a kind of parliamentary system. Uh, yes, uh, so it's. Uh, uh, I quite agree what the uh, Dokun said. This is uh, these 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 so-called Muslim country. They have uh, they are all the, the the people are also 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 uh, also being uh, suffered uh, by human rights violation by their by their own country. So uh, it's not uh, kind of uh, the, about system. So uh, we st strongly believe the civil society, the uh, people in the country like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Pakistan, still we have a lot of support. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, we are very pleased today. Uh, to, uh, Republic Turkey is uh, uh, representative for the United Nations. Uh, uh, very give very good uh, statement concern about the uh, uh, Uyghur situation in China, which is a uh, uh, very positive step. Uh, so uh, about Kashmir, this is a very complicated issue. Kashmir and Pakistan and China and India. Uh, it's uh, we have to connect about uh, before we say anything about uh, we should uh, remind all the time about the uh, Pakistan and China relations and the recent uh, deteriorating uh, relationship with China and Pakistan, especially about the uh, clash uh, in the north uh, border, uh, which uh, India has. And directly have a border with East Turkestan, uh, China called uh, of course their, their territory uh, east of Tibet. There's a there's a, there's one place uh, clash happened uh, last month. That uh, small place it called Dölet Bağ. Dölet Bağ, you know Dölet Bağ. What's in Dölet Bağ? There's not Indian any Indian language, not any Pakistani or Tibetan. Dölet is country, Bağ's garden. Uh, state garden, so we were language. This is part of the historical part, part of the uh, the East Turkestan territory in the 16th, 17th century. That's why, uh, why Dolat Bar, Dolat Eld. When you look at the map, you can see Dolat Eld, another place. This is in Uyghur name. Uh, so it's uh, we have very strong uh, uh, historical connection with the Kashmir people, Indian people, Pakistani people. We are very historically co uh, connected. But we cannot say like my enemies, enemies, my friend. We cannot say that. We cannot say that we share many cultural heritage with Kashmiri people and with Indian people as well. Uh, so uh, we are concerned at the moment. Uh, we are, but we are very pleased. India standing up against China, China's uh, territorial uh, expansion, which is a very good step. Uh, should uh, like. Uh, uh, India should also concern about the uh, Uyghur genocide. Should uh, openly criticize China. That will be even more positive step. And uh, also, we are concerned about uh, uh, the Kashmir situation as well. So, uh, in the world, anywhere in Kashmir, in East Turkestan, uh, shouldn't be there. Shouldn't be uh, any uh, civilian shouldn't be oppressed or they freedom 
should not be taken away uh, by the by the state. So uh, we are strongly also we have sympathy for Kashmir people as well. Thank you so much. And David, final words. Yep. Yes. Okay. I mean, just in explaining the sort of different states' responses to the issue, I would yeah, I would emphasise geopolitics and interstate relations over identity politics. Um, and that really explains why, you know, Imran Khan says he's never heard of this issue um, and that interjects into the, the India-Pakistan-China relations that are, it's fairly obvious. Um, China sees India as, as a CCP often sees India as a sort of westernised state, um, really, so it's close relationship with Pakistan. I mean, I wouldn't general, and I wouldn't generalize about Muslim states' responses. Um, you have Pakistan, you also have Malaysia, who's said we won't extradite Uyghurs. So I really, I, I would emphasize that that's due to state relations. Um, even Erdogan in Turkey called, in 2009, he referred to policy in Xinjiang as cultural genocide. Um, but then they, they sort of came, he visited Xinjiang, visited the Rumchi, and did a number of large resource deals, um, and he didn't say much for some time after that. Um, and so at the end, I just thinking of the sort of civil society silence, um, which has been more shocking for me. Um, it's easy to understand why states uh, look out for their own interests, less easy to understand why ordinary people have been silent. I do think these issues challenge our understanding of China as, as anti-colonial. <coughs> as non-Western, as non-assimilationist, it's not a nation state, it's an inclusive civilization. It's hard to believe this um, because it's, and remember, we, I mean, there is an issue of Eurocentrism here that, I mean, people in the UK don't necessarily understand much about China, they understand much less about Uyghurs. Doing my work, I have to explain to many people what is a Uyghur. So to jump from telling them what is a Uyghur to, trying to understand <laughs> the way China's constructed its narrative of history as a timeless teleology is a bit of a jump. Um, and then finally, really, it is hard to believe, regardless of which state these things happen in, these are psychologically difficult issues to process, the notion that people want to put people in camps and torture them. Um, that's not easy for most people to process. Hannah Arendt wrote about how it was the 1950s, people still didn't believe many accounts of survivors of the Holocaust. They had to fight to get published. Um, the publisher said there's no interest in the US in this topic it, because they're isolated. People are isolated from society and camps or re-education centers. And when they tell their stories, it does seem unbelievable. It's hard to imagine this happening. And I think that challenge is people's sense of what the world is like, but also just what humans can do to each other. Thank you, David. I'll just say uh, back to dehumanization again. So what we find, of course, in case of China, China weaponizes the whole idea of it being the victim of the West and Japan in particular of imperialism. And therefore, the idea is, since China was victim, how dare anyone accuse it of being colonial? And that's something, in fact, the, the three speakers and my, myself and some of us, I mean, we have been working on that constantly to recognize and highlight China's colonial practices, colonial ideology. In fact, a very racialized colonial ideology. So we have discussed some of that and there's some more to discuss. Uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, I, I've been working on Tibet for longer. And I recall this uh, particular Chinese scholar slash official. It's very diff difficult to distinguish between scholars and officials in case of Chinese government, right? So him saying to me that, oh, so long as you criticize us on, and he said us, on Tibet, you're a problem. But the moment you start criticizing us on Uyghurs, then you become an enemy. And that was my introduction to Uyghur issues. It didn't come via Uyghurs. It did not come via my politics, which is of progressivism and challenging injustices. It came via a Chinese official scholar slash nationalist who was very clear that, and he said at that point, of course, remember, they, in fact, even after 2008, the Chinese government tried to portray even Tibetans as terrorists. So when uh, Tibetans were sort of um, 
committing self-immolation, so burning themselves up in protest, even that was classified as terrorism for some time. So the reality, of course, is regardless of what Uyghurs, Tibetans, Mongols, or Hong Kong people do, whether they adopt peaceful means, non-peaceful means, whether they adopt ask for cultural rights, they ask for political rights, they ask for freedom, does not make any difference because from Chinese government's perspective, all of them are same, which is the extremist, separatist, terrorist, and therefore they have to be vanquished. So that's the kind of colonization you're talking of, DMI we're talking of. And thank you to three amazing speakers for highlighting this. We have recorded it, we'll put it on YouTube. And my final thank, however, goes to Anna, who organized all of this. Where are you, Anna? Oh. Thank you so much. And that's it. Thank you, everyone, by the way. That's thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you, Aziz Alkundevit.